All right, so this is OpenStax US History, Chapter 4, Section 5, Wars for Empire. So in Chapter 4 here, we are building up to the beginnings or origins of the American Revolution. And one of the events which really begins to get the ball rolling, so to speak, for the events of the American Revolution to take place is the Seven Years' War, which is one of these uh, wars for empire that this uh, section talks about. So one important thing to understand is that when England goes to war with France and when England goes to war with Spain, that so too do the colonies. So if England and, and France are at Spain, so too are New England and New France. So these conflicts, you know, stretch across the Atlantic Ocean and translate into the New World. Here in your uh, textbook, we have a map of one of these various conflicts. We could see New France here in the orange or, or, or whatever color that is, uh, England in the purple color here, or New England. And so, you know, when one of these wars would break out and, you know, these countries went to war with one another, practically every 15 years or so in, you know, during the 1700s, those colonies too would go to war with each other. So that spills over, right, that colonial connection from the old world to the new world. Now, when talking about warfare in the, uh, in the, what would this be, I guess, the 17th and 18th centuries, the 1600s, the 1700s, uh, warfare was seasonal, meaning that you would, in the spring, slash summer months, that would be time to fight. And in the winter, that would more or less be time to rest. You know, the, the natural world sort of put limitations on when you could conduct war, and certainly, you know, that was the case. Uh, in the military, there was very harsh discipline, and even some cases, officers could kill their own soldiers for disobeying orders. So this was a very strict sort of system. And generally speaking, uh, you know, troops fought with very bright uniforms and very tight coordinated formations on the battlefield. It was shoulder to shoulder. The weapon of choice was a musket and two armies would typically engage on a battlefield lined up in a position and fire essentially into each other's faces. For the purposes of our class, it's probably a good thing to note that the British wore bright red. So the red coats were the British soldiers. So you see them depicted in some of these images here. These would be, uh, you know, your British troops right here in the red. That's how the British distinguished themselves on the battlefield. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, the countries of England and their rivals, Spain and France, went to war almost you know, practically every 15 years uh, in the 1700s. And so your textbook talks about a couple of these conflicts, uh, you know, not in too much detail, because at the end of the day, what all these conflicts had in common was that very little actually changed as a result of these wars. I mean, there were some minor territorial acquisitions, but neither of them had any dramatic impact on the new world or even the old world. Uh, they were mostly parts of much larger conflicts that took place in Europe at the time. So these were just kind of theaters that broke out in the new world. And these are all the names that they went by in the new world. So for example, you might have had a war like the War of Spanish Succession that occurred in Europe that was much larger and, and had a lot of different countries. But because England, France, and Spain were involved, that meant that the colonies also broke out in skirmishes. And so you had conflicts across the Atlantic world. Uh, these two wars were with England and France. The War of Jenkins' Ear was with Spain, and this one too was with France. So this was very, very common, common occurrence uh, leading up to the um, leading up to the American Revolution. Now, one of these wars in particular are, you know, as I say, not like the other, and had a rather dramatic role on not only the events leading up to the American Revolution, but actually on the continent itself. Whereas very little changed from all of these wars, and they were uh, you know, not so consequential. From the French and Indian War, what we find is that a lot changes from this war. It is very consequential. So the French and Indian War fought from 1754 to 1763. It's called the French and Indian War because from the perspective of England, 
they are fighting against France and their Indian allies. The French, remember, had very good relations comparatively with the indigenous population, so they have a lot of alliances. And this war has its origins over French and British land claims. So as you can see from this image here, uh, or this map here, I should say, that everything that is in the yellow is disputed territory between Britain and France. Uh, New England is here in the purple. France is here in the, uh, I don't know, orangish sort of color there. And so everything that is in yellow is uh, disputed territory specifically, and let's see if we can find it, this area right here that was called the Ohio Territory. It's actually located in modern day Pennsylvania, uh, Pittsburgh to be precise. And this was a very important um, area due to the geography. You had three rivers that met there. It was highly sought after by the French, highly sought after by the British, highly sought after by uh, Native Americans as well. The French were the first to act. They constructed Fort Duquesne. This was a French fort designed to protect that area. George Washington, who was working for Virginia, uh, took a militia out there and opened fire on French forces. And it was the opening or, or the, the very first skirmish that occurred between Washington and his men, who Washington at the time, again, was an unknown. He was um, you know, a land surveyor, and he had been ordered by the colony of Virginia to go out and more or less stake a claim for, for, for Great Britain out there as well. And when his men opened fire on the French, it started this whole conflict known as the Seven Years' War. When that happened, both the French and the British uh, you know, sent professional troops from, uh, that's not, you can't really see that all that well, we'll do it in brown here. Uh, you know, they sent professional British troops from Europe to come and fight this war for the colonies. And so you had what was at the time the largest group of people, single group of people, uh, move across the Atlantic Ocean in order to fight this war, British reinforcements mostly. Uh, initially, the British did not do well. Uh, fort Necessity was the fort in which Washington surrendered. Uh, interestingly enough, this was the only time that Washington surrendered in his military career. Uh, General Edward Braddock was a real sort of well-known and respected military guy back in Europe. He was essentially a badass. He came to the New World and was killed in action. You know, this guy was supposed to be the hero for the British cause of the war effort. So things go very, very poorly. Uh, your map also indicates where Braddock was defeated right here and also where George Washington was forced to surrender at Fort Necessity. Uh, however, though, the British then appointed William Pitt to be essentially in charge of the war effort. He later on becomes a prime minister. We'll just call him a minister. Uh, we'll call him just the minister of war, for lack of a better term. And once he takes over the war effort, things start, start going a lot better. And one of the reasons is because William Pitt is willing to cooperate with the colonies, whereas for the most part, uh, you know, a lot of people in Great Britain kind of feel like the colonists are an obstacle. And if the colonists would just get out of the way, the British could get the job done with the professionals. Uh, William Pitt is much more willing to cooperate with the colonists. He understands where the colonies are at. Uh, he's a much more sympathetic figure from the perspective of the colonies. Uh, you have major victories, including the capture of the French capital in Quebec, the French city of Montreal. The British Navy plays a big role in its victory. You can see here, actually I should stop using this color because you can't see uh, there, but you can see here, especially British forces traveling down the St. Lawrence River, which they did, and just bombarding practically every French fortification that they could see. And, and of course the British had a superior Navy. What came out of this conflict was the Treaty of Paris, 1763. And the most important consequence of this was that French territory then went to British hands, right? So England wins, right? Don't let that get lost here. England wins this war, right? Very importantly. And all of this territory here, we'll go ahead and use purple to indicate that this is now uh, belonging to Great Britain. All this territory, 
right? Everything right here, all of this, right? That now all belongs to England. So massive spoils of war, essentially New France as a colony, uh, more or less ceases to exist, right? You know, this war, it, it ends with the just, you know, New France no longer being put on the map. So that was a, a huge victory for the British. And in fact, they celebrated it. This term rule Britannia was this sort of British patriotism that was, uh, you know, not just, you know, very powerful in Great Britain, but also among the colonists. I mean, this wasn't just a British victory. This was a colonial victory because the two sides were essentially one. But in the details of this conflict lies a huge problem. And that problem eventually leads to the events that we call the American Revolution. We'll go ahead and use green to indicate money here. And that is the massive war debt. Even though Great Britain won, the uh, national debt doubled. And the question that the British are asking is, who is going to pay this war debt? Wars are expensive. And even though the British side won, they had, they owed a lot of money. And the question was, who is going to pay? 